Steve done. Sirwin, yeah, so unfortunately, has a rotator cuff uh, injury. So he has to have surgery. So he will be able to present his own talk at Hamvention this year. But for now, he gave me his slides. I talked with him on the phone last night. So I'm going to present his work for him. So Steve uh, is talking about ionospheric disturbances at dawn, dusk, and during the 2017 eclipse. And actually, a version of this talk has already been published in QEX. And you can download that article for free from hamsci.org with permission from the ARRL. So um, as most of you probably are aware, there was a solar eclipse on August 21st, 2017. And because the shadow of the uh, moon, the, sh the shadow caused by the moon of the sun going across the United States uh, blocks the UV rays from the sun, you get changes in the ionosphere condition. And so he wanted to see how he could measure that with amateur radio equipment. He used two different frequencies for this. He used 5 megahertz WWV and 60 kilohertz WWVB. He was located in Myco, Texas, and he was listening to uh, the stations in Fort Collins, Colorado, and the propagation path was completely south of the line of totality. But note that near San Antonio, you still had 70% partial eclipse, so you still expect to see some sort of effect over here. This talk is divided into two sections. The first section looks at the amplitude response of these signals, and the second section looks at the frequency Doppler shift response of these signals. So for the amplitude section, um, he had two different setups. For WWVB, he had a 60 kilohertz tuned loop antenna into a homebrew receiver, which you see right here, which I'm told that David Kasdan now is in possession of this, so he can continue to use that. And then this went out to a spectrum analyzer, out to a digital oscilloscope, and out to a digitizing device that was connected to the laptop computer. To listen to 5 megahertz WWV, he used a horizontally polarized dipole antenna, an ICOM R9000 receiver, and he took the S meter voltage out of that and sent that to the digitizer. And that's what gave him the data for the amplitude. Uh, this is an example of the ex uh, 5 megahertz uh, WWV uh, S meter voltages and the WWVB peak and demodulated waveforms as recorded by the data logger. So the purple line here, this is the 5 megahertz signal, and this is the day uh, after, a couple days after the eclipse. This is August 23rd, so this is like control data right here. So 5 megahertz, you can see it's mostly smooth. There's a few little blips down here. For WWVB, uh, you see the uh, demodulated envelope voltage down here in green, and then you can see a peak uh, envelope voltage that he um, uh, did himself in uh, pink. And one of the things he wanted you to notice is that there are a lot of static crashes on this particular signal. You can see one right here, and you can see one right here, and this is believed to be from lightning. And so the way he did his algorithm for processing, he was able to remove those static crashes from the uh, demodulated envelope voltage. Note, though, that you do see some artifacts of those in the S meter voltage right from the R9000 receiver. So this, again, is uh, control data. This is from a few days before the eclipse, uh, 10 August 2017. And this is from the day after the eclipse, 2000 August. And the green is your 5 megahertz trace, and the uh, white is the uh, peak envelope voltage of the WWVB 60 kilohertz trace, and you can see how it's divided into night and day, and you can see that there's a lot more variability at nighttime in both the WWVB 60 kilohertz signal and the WWV 5 megahertz signal. During the day, things are much smoother, so there's a bit of selective fading going on at night. It's much more active at night. So the eclipse-induced um, enhancement, it actually uh, 
the eclipse happened during uh, daylight hours and so created about a 10 dB enhancement in both the 5 megahertz signal and the 60 uh, kilohertz WWVB signal. So this is quite a large enhancement. And this is likely due to a decrease in um, D region absorption as the eclipse is coming through. So you could really see that enhancement there. Um, he also looked at the transition from nighttime to daytime propagation. And what he noticed is that at each, uh, at each of the transitions, there is a deep null in uh, the WWVB uh, transition. And this is from multiple days. So you can see uh, from July 4th all the way to July 9th, they all follow the same general trend. The timing of the nulls is generally tracked, generally tracked sunrise and sunset. As the days got shorter, uh, the morning null occurred later in the day and the evening null occurred earlier. So possible mechanisms include multipath interference between the competing daytime and nighttime propagation modes of different path lengths or wave speeds. So uh, for instance, nighttime ground wave and daytime uh, elevated duct or phase shifts caused by elevation dependent wave speed. So you get uh, possible cancellations of those signals as the propagation changes. So in summary of this section, um, the eclipse resulted in a peak enhancement of 10 dB at both 60 kilohertz and 5 megahertz, even though uh, propagation was completely below the path of totality. The transition from nighttime to daytime propagation for WWBB was marked by a sharp and deep null suggesting multipath interference between competing propagation modes, and the timing of the nulls was observed to track sunrise and sunset from day to day. Uh, besides being stronger, the WWVB propagation uh, exhibits much more selective fading than daytime propagation. On some days, the selective fading showed some periodicity. Uh, by contrast, WWVB uh, propagation was mostly smooth uh, half sine wave amplitude between the morning and evening nulls. So the daytime was free from selective fading. So this is the section for the frequency measurement test or the Doppler shift um, experiment. And here the objective was to measure the frequency of a sky wave HF signal. Um, so we want to look for frequency shifts. Uh, the communication uh, receivers generally don't have enough uh, significant digits for accuracy. So uh, what he did was he used the USB mode of an ICOM R86000 communications receiver, uh, tune it a little bit low from the carrier frequency of WWV, and uh, then he used an audio spectrum analyzer to uh, measure the offset. Uh, one thing that's interesting here is he did not use a disciplined, uh, like a GPS disciplined oscillator. This was just the uh, R8600 communications receiver that he let it warm up, and it was stable enough. Uh, by contrast, he tried some other uh, relatively expensive amateur radio gear, and it was not as stable. So he found this particular receiver was able to do this. So on the air, frequency measurements of 5 megahertz uh, showed uh, WWV showed smooth daytime and turbulent nighttime characteristics with a prominent negative swing at dusk and a positive swing at dawn. And so you can see that over here um, as it goes uh, from night into day um, here and then from day into night at the bottom. So here you see this negative shift in frequency and um, going from night into day and you can see this positive shift in frequency going from day into night. You can also note here that there are multiple um, traces on the uh, nighttime transition. So you have one trace there and another trace there. And so we can talk about that in a minute. So the descending and ascending ionization regions um, can provide some path length changes required for the Doppler shift. So as the Earth rotates this way and the ionosphere and upper atmosphere rotates with it, uh, the ascending ionization in the evening, so over here the ionosphere lifts up, you get longer path lengths. And as, you, as the path length increases, you get a lengthening path and a negative Doppler shift. And in the morning, um, you find its opposite. 
and Steve did uh, calculations to account for both the speed of the Earth's rotation and found, and, and found that that simple model accounted for the Doppler shift uh, within a very good um, uh, fraction of a hertz. Uh, the time of the frequency shift shows partial correlation with the shadowing, but the frequency shift extends well into full sun, suggesting a change, uh, changing wave speed uh, also plays a role. And so what he's saying there is that you can, even as you go from night into day, you continue to see Doppler shifts once you get into full daylight. So as the ionosphere is building up, um, you s continue to see the shifts because uh, you get more electron density, uh, more refraction, um, and the process continues until things stabilize. And the opposite happens at night. So possible contributors to the multiple frequency swings, um, and this is that multiple track that you see right here, possible contribute contributions to that. Um, you can have multiple paths. You can have high angle ray paths where you might get two hops. You can get a single um, hop, um, either from the F layer, or you can get a single hop from the E layer. And so if you have a condition where you can get all of these hops happening at the same time, you might have uh, the ability to see both of these traces at the same time. And to support that, he looked at uh, three different frequencies, both 2.5 megahertz, 5 megahertz, and 10 megahertz. Um, if we start at 5 megahertz, you see both traces very strongly here. If you see 10 megahertz, you only see one trace here. If you look at this ionogram from Austin, Texas, near where he is, uh, it shows that the critical frequency never goes above, um, this is, I think, eight, this is 8 megahertz right here. It never goes above 7 to 8 megahertz. So it's well below 10 megahertz. So you can't get that high angle path. So in this case, you only get the low angle paths. At 5 megahertz, which is well below the critical frequency, you get both the low and the high angle paths, accounting for both of these. And at 2.5 megahertz, you can still see both paths, but it's much weaker, especially the lower path, because this is um, you're uh, suffering more ionospheric absorption. And so uh, in summary, uh, we've seen these ionospheric changes at the different frequencies. And I will just leave it there because of time. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, Tom. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, Joe, uh, it's the chart on the lower left corner. Can you explain this that? One. Yes. Okay. So what this is saying is that um, if you have the ionosphere, if you have two paths for the ionosphere for propagation, say just the green ones, if you have just the green ones, that will show up on the trace as two different paths. But if the ionosphere raises, the higher path uh, should show more of a change than the lower path. Yes. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. And I think you'll see um, a number of the talks coming up next. Like David will be talking about um, using inexpensive receivers to measure this sort of Doppler shift. And the whole idea of distributing this um, personal space weather station network, we should, our goal is to create all of those cross paths across the um, totality in many different directions. And then hopefully we can image the, the wave field and all of those changes. All right. Thank you very much.